Hello again. Back again for the next Bible story from the life of David. Now he's king, and he's going to start acting like a king. King David set up his capital in the city of Jerusalem and decided to bring the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. Remember the Ark of the Covenant? From when God made the temple, we had to skip over that, that series of lessons just for sake of time. But we did have a story about the Ark of the Covenant, how important it was. It's not a, a special good luck charm or anything like that. Remember the big daggone fish god that was a statue that fell over and and broke apart when the enemy put the Ark of the Covenant into their temple of Dagon. Okay, so the Ark of the Covenant was was what God wanted to be set up in the middle of the temple and on, in a very special place called the Holy of Holies where he would his presence would come down each year for the um, forgiveness of sin sacrifice that the that the um, priest would bring in once a year, the high priest. Anyway, okay, so we're not done with that yet. He decided he wanted to bring the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. That made sense. Since the Ark of the Covenant was a part of the tabernacle furniture and it represented the presence of God in the midst of his people, it was sometimes called the Ark of God. God had given specific laws regarding how it should be transported. The Levites, remember they were the tribe of Levi, and they were the ones that were supposed to be the priests. The Levites were to lift it up by the poles attached to it and carry it on their shoulders. It was they had very specific rules that they had to treat it properly. This was God's furniture for his special tabernacle, his special temple, and they had specific rules that God gave them. Each person had a, a job, and the they were supposed to do their own job. The Levites were supposed to lift it up by the poles attached to it and carry it on their shoulders, just the Levites. Many years before the Ark of the Covenant had been captured in battle, they're going to remind us, by the Philistines. Because strange calamities befell those who kept the Ark, the Philistines became afraid of it. Remember, there were plagues that started to happen in their country. And so it returned to the land of Israel by the cows. Remember the cows that pulled it that had to be, they were sent from God, sent them from their babies, and that was very unnatural for them to do that, so we knew it was God that was making them take the ark back to Israel. Well, 20 years, the ark of God had rested in the house of a priest named Abinadab. It was with a priest. King David announced that he was going to bring the Ark of God to Jerusalem. Made sense. David organized a magnificent procession. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to put this picture up. There's an idea of what someone thinks the Ark of the Covenant looks like. I don't know if you can tell very well, but there's angels here, and their wings pretty much touch right there, and this is that special chest here that they had put Aaron's rod in and some manna and the Ten Commandments and it was a very special place all made out of gold. Okay, you can't see it very well. You know how our projector kind of puts funny lights on things, but it gives you an idea. That's what the Ark of the Covenant might have looked like since they didn't have cameras back then. We don't know for sure, but there's a really de detailed description in the Bible of how they were supposed to make it. So we know that's what it looked like if you read that. That's back in um, the book of Exodus, I believe. All right, David plans, David organized a magnificent procession like a parade to bring the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. Besides the great company of the priests, the Levites, and ordinary citizens, also 30,000 soldiers came to escort the Ark of the Covenant to the city of Jerusalem. It was a happy occasion, joyous occasion. If you've ever seen the parades, Thanksgiving Day parades, Christmas Day parades, and everybody goes out to the street and they yell and they're happy and excited. Well, this was a very special excitement. They were all excited that David was king and they were rebuilding the temple or wanted to rebuild the temple. And David was bringing the very important Ark of the Covenant. It was very important to the Israelites. Since David and the Israelites had not read God's instructions, okay, that was back way back with Moses. They gave the specific instructions to Moses of how it was supposed to be handled. And it's been hundreds of years later and no one's had to handle it. 
well, no, I'm sorry, it's not 100 years later. Well, 100 years later from Moses, but it says it was 20 years, only 20 years in the house of Abinadab. But um, it had been a long time since anyone had handled it. And so um, David didn't do his homework. He didn't study about it. God said it was very important, very sacred, and not to disrespect it and it had to be handled a certain way remember god has rules for a reason and it's not up to us to decide we don't like it or not god's not going to change his 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 rules and if we don't know what his rules are it's our job to go and find out what they are so you need to read that's why you need to read the bible be a student of the bible so you know exactly what god wants you to do so king david is a very important man and he should have known or at least talked to god about this before it happened he was he had good intentions in heart he wanted to do something amazing for god so he had the right intentions but he didn't really talk to god about this so david arranged for the ark to be transported to jerusalem on a brand new cart they made pulled by oxen David arranged for the, it was probably very decorated, who knows. David arranged for Abinadab's sons to drive the cart. The ark was covered with a blue cloth as the law of Moses commanded. They knew some of the things, it, it sounds like. As the procession win, winded its way toward the capital city, the enormous crowd, especially David, rejoiced triumphantly. Here it comes. Everybody is excited. Here comes the Ark of the Covenant, bringing it back to, Jer to bringing it to Jerusalem, the capital of Israel. Um, I'm sorry, I lost my place. Let's see. Suddenly, the oxen stumbled on the un uneven ground. Remember, it wasn't supposed to be pulled by oxen. It was supposed to be held very carefully by the Levites. But one of the oxen stumbled, and Uzzah. One of Abinadab's sons, Abinadab was the high priest at the time, Uzzah immediately just reached out, just knee-jerk reaction, reached out to catch it like we would. <gasps> catch it real quick, right? To steady it. And when he did so, something terrible happened. Uzzah immediately fell flat on the ground. People rushed to see what had happened and they realized Uzzah was dead. Everyone was startled and horrified. Uzzah had just reached out to grab it so it wouldn't fall, and now he's dead? The word of this tragedy quickly passed throughout the procession, and the rejoicing of the people immediately stopped and turned to fear and shock. David was especially dismayed. This was all his idea and his plans. He felt responsible for it. Now he was afraid to bring the ark into Jerusalem. The celebration and procession ended abruptly. David left the Ark of the Covenant at the house of Obed-Edom, the Jatite, instead of bringing it into the city of Jerusalem. David and the leaders of Israel could not understand why. Why did God struck Uzzah dead for touching the Ark? They were doing a good thing here, they thought. At that time, they did not even realize that they had disobeyed God's laws concerning transporting the Ark. They began to realize anew that God is holy. He is a holy God. Even though the whole world is changing around us, God stays the same. And he doesn't change his rules just because people out in society say, ah, I think this is okay now. Let's just start doing this. That's okay. Everyone says it's okay, so it must be okay. It's not okay with God. He takes, he set the rules. He never changes them and he stays the same. And it's our job to know what those rules are. And it's our job to respect God and revere God and worship God and obey God. So they began to realize and remember, oh, God is holy. Since the ark represents God's presence, they had forgotten how holy God is and how they needed to follow his laws concerning the ark. God used the death of Uzzah to teach David and the people of Israel a great lesson. It's also a lesson for us. We cannot treat lightly the things of God. They do on TV all the time. We've talked about this. Makes me so angry the way they take God's name in vain and say um, Jesus loudly in an angry way. It makes me so sick to my stomach. It makes me so sad. They treat the things of God very lightly. And we have to remember that when we approach God, we must approach God only in the way he says. Otherwise, we incur his anger. 
In the Bible, we are told that only way we can come to a holy God is through the blood of Jesus Christ. No other way. Remember, we've talked about this many times. Only one way to get to heaven through Jesus. You can't change it. You can't pay money for it. You can't somehow get everyone in the world to vote for a new way to get to heaven. There's no such thing. Only God's way. We can't make it up ourselves. The Ark of God stayed in the house of Obed-Edom for three months. During this time, God greatly blessed Obed-Edom and his family in many ways to show his approval for those who were obeying his laws. When David heard how the Ark had been such a great blessing to Obed-Edom and his family, David longed more than ever to bring it back to Jerusalem. But before doing so, however, he and others went and searched the scriptures, the Bible, diligently to find the correct way to transport the Ark of the Covenant. They found that the law of Moses commanded the Ark was to be carried on the shoulders of the Levites, not on a cart drawn by oxen. Then they realized that this had been their mistake before. Now they're going to do it right. They're going to transport the Ark correctly. David knew that God would bless them if they transported the Ark according to his plan. I'm sorry, I'm behind on pictures. There's a picture of the oxen and the man who tried to ooze who tried to catch it. So, now that they know the, remember the rules, David again organized a great procession. But this time, the Levites carried the Ark of the Covenant of God on their shoulders like God commanded. God demonstrated this, that his presence was never to be carried on a cart but on the shoulders of men. It looks different to me than it looks to you guys. I'm still trying to get this figured out. <laughs> um, God always uses men to represent him before other men. This taught the people that the Levites, who were God's special servants, were the ones to represent his presence to the people of Israel. David was especially happy to bring the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. The trumpets sounded and musicians played all kinds of instruments and the people shouted as the ark passed by them. It was a great day of joy and celebration. David was as excited as a little child as he led the procession. The scripture states that he danced before the Lord with all his might, with much like a little child jumping for joy and down, jumping up and down with joy and excitement. The Levites sacrificed oxen and other animals to the Lord along the processional route. By doing this, they were asking God's forgiveness in case there were some other law that they had overlooked in transporting the ark. The Levites carried the ark all the way into Jerusalem and placed it in the tabernacle. Then David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. After that, David had food distributed to all the people. Celebration. It was a very happy day for everyone, except one person. If you watch, hopefully you're you did what you were supposed to two days ago you're supposed to watch those little cartoons they talked a lot about michael his wife we haven't talked a lot about her but remember he she was the prize for david's defeating the philistines remember david um, goliath michael was up in her window i don't have a picture of that watching the procession take place from her window she had watched with disgust as the procession entered Jerusalem. She did not share in David's enthusiasm for the return of the Ark of the Covenant. She was very disturbed as she watched her husband in the procession. When she saw her husband, King David, dancing before the Ark, she despised him and thought he was very, very embarrassed. She thought he was acting so foolishly, more like a servant or a child than a king. After the celebration was all over and David returned home, she criticized David for what she considered unsuitable behavior for a king. But David said, but my actions were not for you or for anyone else. They were for the Lord who chose me before your father to be the ruler over the people of Israel. Therefore, I will play before the Lord. David let Michael know that when he was before the Lord, he did not look upon himself as a king. He was just another child or servant of God. Therefore, he felt his actions were very appropriate since they were unto God. David was sure that God accepted him, and he felt his people also understood his heart and appreciated him. He regretted, though, that his wife didn't understand that he had a lowly position before God, a humble. We see from this that David was a very humble man. It's too bad that Michael had to cr criticize her husband on this very special happy day. 
Not only did David feel the scorn of her criticism, but God also saw her criticism. As a result, the scriptures state that she never had any children. David enjoyed great peace in his realm because God had given him victory over the Philistines. David was very grateful to God for all the blessings he gave them. As David enjoyed these blessings, he remembered the Lord's house, which was at, still, at this time only a tent. It was still portable. Whereas he himself had a beautiful palace to live in. Now the Ark of the Covenant was in Jerusalem. David felt it was time to build a larger, more beautiful and permanent house for the Ark of God to rest in. So David sent for Nathan the prophet. Remember Samuel is gone and Nathan now takes his place. <clears throat> he told Nathan that it had come into his heart to build a beautiful temple for the ark of God to show, to show his great love. I live in a house of cedar, David said to Nathan, while the ark of God dwells in a tent. I would like to build a house for the ark of God. The prophet Nathan thought David's idea was very good and encouraged him to pursue it. Later that night, however, though, Nathan received a message from the Lord. The Lord told Nathan to instruct David not to build a house. For him. Instead, God said that he would build a house. Excuse me, he would build David a house. Nathan told David that this house that God would build for David would not be a building of cedar. David already had one of those. It, instead, it would be a ruling family that would continue to rule over Israel and have a very special part in God's plan for the world. If you ever watch any of the royalty from the country of England, the, the family is called the Windsor family that has passed down the king to king to queen. So the queen of England, soon her first son would be the next king of England and they call that the house of Windsor. So David, like that, would be a ruling family where they pass it down. So that's the house God was referring to. When David's reign was over, I'm sorry. Um, instead, it would be a ruling family that would continue to rule over Israel and have a very special part in God's plan for the world. When David's reign over Israel ended at his death, the prophet Nathan said that his son would succeed him as the next king and that he would build the, that his son would get to build that beautiful temple for God. Nathan said that someone from David's family would continue to reign over Israel, which meant that from David's family, the future king of Israel who is Jesus, the Messiah, would be born out of David's family. His great, 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 great grandson would be the Messiah. The promise was fulfilled when Jesus was indeed born in the city of David in Bethlehem to be our savior. Imagine how David must have felt when the prophet Nathan gave him this message from God. It took away any disappointment of him not being able to build a temple for the Lord. And he felt so very privileged to know that Messiah Jesus would come from his family and one would and would one day rule over God's everlasting kingdom. Jesus is the eternal king who will reign forever and ever. I can't wait till that day when we don't have any more politicians, no more presidents, no more prime ministers, no more kings. Well, except for Jesus. We will only have Jesus, God, um, to reign over us and he will do a brilliant, wonderful, wonderful job. If you have received Jesus as your Savior, then you too are a part of God's great kingdom. We're a part of this. And we can be so thankful that God gave us his son to die for us so that we don't have to be scared in any scary time. If you know Jesus in your heart, if you've repented from being a sin sinner of all your sin, I always ask you guys, how many sins does it take to keep you out of heaven? Usually everybody raises their finger, one, and we've all done that. We've all sinned and come short of God's glory. So in order to get that, we had to have a Savior, and our Savior is Jesus, who lived a perfect life and gave his life for us. So turn from your sin, repent, and say, God, I'm so sorry for my sin. I believe in Jesus. I believe in you, that you've sent him to be my Savior. I will accept him, and I want to follow you for the rest of my days and do what you want me to do. That's what he wants from us. And that's what he died, sent his own son to die for us. So in these times, we don't have to be afraid because we've got God and God's gonna take care of us. 
And even if we were to die, everyone dies usually unless Jesus comes back first. We say one out of every one person dies, 100% of people die. It's just part of the life that we have now on this sin-cursed earth. It's our punishment for, um, for sin. And Jesus took that punishment away so that for eternal death, so that once we die, our disposable bodies we've talked about that houses our soul inside, the real, the real us inside of our disposable bodies, when we're done with these disposable bodies, we're going to go to be somewhere forever and ever for eternity. And it's so important that you know where that is. And especially in these scary times, we never know what's going to happen on this cursed earth, but we do know we have a Savior who loves us and who will protect us and carry us home to heaven someday. See you guys later.